welcome all once again to uh, Builders Association's uh, Quality Improvement Program. Uh, it's uh, a real pleasure to see you all again here. And thank you so much for being here, despite of all your busy schedules. And uh, uh, now let me welcome Dr. Anil Joseph uh, to give a brief introduction uh, about the uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Jimmy Thomas. Uh, Anil, sir, please. Yeah, good evening, uh, Jimmy sir, and good evening, Nebu, and my dear participants. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this 15th session of the Quality Improvement Program for Engineers and Supervisors organized by Builders Association of India. Today, we have with us Dr. Jimmy Thomas, a well known geotechnical consultant engineer who is specialized in geosynthetics, reinforced soil structures, and pavement engineering. He is also working as CEO of Geosynthetic Technology Advices, Advisory Services LLP, Jaipur, and consultant to TechFab India Industries Limited, Mumbai, Sachi Geosynthetics Private Limited, Delhi, Sachi Geotechnics Private Limited, Australia, and Titan Environmental Containment Limited, Canada. Dr. Jimmy Thomas has done his graduation in civil engineering from Regional Engineering College, Calicut and has done his post-graduation from College of Engineering to Antrim and PhD from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. <clears throat> he has 25 years of industrial and five years of teaching experience. He has worked extensively in the field of geosynthetic and reinforced soil structure. Dr. Jimmy Thomas is presently an executive committee member of the Cochin chap local chapter of Indian Geotechnical Society, member of the International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering, Technical Committee TC213 on score and erosion and Vice President of the International Geosynthetic Society India. He was recently elected as the member of the National Executive Committee of Indian Geosynthetical Society for the term 2021-22. He, he has served on technical committees of Bureau of Indian Standards and Indian Road Congress and actively participating in the formulation of courts and standards. And more importantly, he is a very close associate, a very close friend, and a pillar of support for the geotechnical activities in Kerala and the Indian Geotechnical Society Kochi chapter. And it's a proud privilege for me to welcome this uh, depth of knowledge and a very simple and humble personality to present today regarding the introduction to earth retaining structures. Over to you, Jimmy Thomas, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Anil. Uh, it's very happy to be here for this um, series of programs organized by Bai. And first of all, let me thank Bai and uh, the Construction Philosophy and Dr. Anil Joseph for giving me this opportunity. So, um, start my presentation and probably I'll just uh, stop my video for better clarity of presentation. Try to share my screen. Hope it is visible. Yes. Okay. The today's topic uh, I have selected introduction to earth retaining structures because this is uh, probably after foundations. This is one of the most uh, common application in geotechnical engineering. So uh, uh, basically, I'll be try to uh, look at the fundamentals first of all. Like we will ask the question, like why do we need earth retaining structures at all? Then we will look at the various types. Actually, there are different types of earth retaining structures. And one particular topic, like we know, like um, so normally most of the failures of earth retaining structures or retaining walls occur, or even slopes occur after the monsoon, after heavy rainfall. So we will look at why this happens. Actually, so this is only an introduction. So basically, I will try to cover more breadth. Basic idea is to cover. What are the various types of options available to us engineers? So we will not be going into great depth, actually. So first of all, like why do we need a retaining wall or a earth retaining structure? So if you look at, we have seen, like if, you, if it is a good quality rock, hard rock, then it starts at 90 degrees, probably maybe 
10, 20, or even 50 years, no problem like that. So it doesn't need a retaining structure. But if it is soil or sand, we know from our experience that, see, we cannot expect it to stand at a very steep angle. So we all know there is something known as angle of repose. It may stand at maybe 30 degree, 35 degree, not more than that. So if we, the basic idea is the friction. Like if we recall our simple school physics, like if you have a block, if I try to push it, it moves, actually, it will slide. But if I apply a normal force, if I just hold it down, it is, becomes very difficult to push it. That means it has got sliding resistance. So the, the strength, the resistance to sliding comes from friction. And normally the, the sliding resistance or shear resistance is related to the normal force, which we call the coefficient of friction. So now if I try to, like if it is, if this uh, table is horizontal, the block is stable. Now, if I tilt, see, up to a certain angles, nothing happens, the block is stable, but when it reaches a particular angle, it slides. Actually. So this, if you call phi, it is simply the, what we call angle of internal friction in soils, something very similar, or the coefficient of friction is equal to tan phi. That is a basic idea, like, but if, if I stick this block with a strong glue, or assume this is a brick, and I fix it with cement mortar, it hardens. Then even if keep it, if you tilt it by 90 degrees, it will not fall because there is a strong cohesive bond between the block and the base actually. So we you know like uh, anything, if anything has to stand vertical, it has to have strong cohesion actually. So we know like concrete or wood or steel, there is no issue. Like a concrete column will stand vertically like that. A concrete retaining wall stands vertically, but soil, we cannot make it stand because you know, the basic reason is it doesn't have cohesion. It has only a frictional strength. So it can be stable only up to a certain inclination. So now, like we have a, a 90 degree, like a fill or a cutting soil. So we know like this will not stand stable actually. Like if it is sand, we know it will immediately collapse. This wedge will fall down. So why it happens, we can analyze the equilibrium. Like suppose we, uh, like you draw a free body diagram of the wedge and mark out the forces. We have this force polygon. One is a self weight. Then on this phase, there is a reaction which we can resolve into two components normal force and a tangential force. So if you do this, if you actually, uh, if you can measure the force or we can calculate the force and draw the force polygon, we know it will not close actually. This, there is a gap, which means there is a net unbalanced force. So this unbalanced force, it causes the wedge to fall down. See now, if you want to keep this wedge in equilibrium, we have to apply an equal and opposite force. So this is what a retaining wall does actually, because uh, like when the soil is at this uh, vertical phase, this wedge is unstable. There is an unbalanced force, which has to be uh, opposed by a retaining wall. So the retaining wall keeps the wedge in equilibrium. See, now we need a retaining wall in two types of situations. One is like we have the original ground here and we have to raise the ground level by filling. We have to place the fill. So we need a retaining wall to retain it. One solution is to have a slope actually because a stable slope, but many, many times we don't have the sufficient land to accommodate the slope. So we have to go for a retaining wall. Other situation is a cut actually. We have the original ground level. So we have to excavate vertically down. So there also we need a retaining wall. So in this case, the retaining wall retains fill, fill material, that means soil which is brought from some other place, placed in layers and compacted. Whereas here, the retaining wall retains the natural ground. So the type of retaining wall, the construction method, everything will be different in these two situations. So like our selection of the type of retaining wall will be influenced by a lot, whether it is fill or cut. So when we design a retaining wall, the first question we ask is like, is it going to retain fill or is it going to retain cut? And some of the applications we are all familiar, like uh, see one is construction of approach embankments. Like if you have an approach to a flyover or a bridge, you need to construct an embankment. And many times the normal idea is to have a slope 
which for most soils like it will be something like uh, uh, like one vertical two horizontal like but if it is a like a uh, village possible like we can have that much land we can do it but in a city this is not possible so we need retaining walls another example is a hill road or a railway line in a hilly area so we have to make this platform for the construction so for that it may be partially in cut and partially in fill both like for the support the fill retain the fill we need retaining structure similarly somewhere like uh, in hilly area suppose if you want to construct an airport like we recently we have like we heard about the there was an accident in the uh, the calicut airport Similarly, the Mangalore airport also, these are all what you know, a stable top airport in hill areas, like the runway, like we do a lot of filling and create the runway actually. Or we can do cut also, there is another option. Then any hill area to do construction, suppose I want to construct a house or a building, I need to create a level platform. For that, you have to do this, either cut or fill, sometimes both. Ideal is cut and fill because we have to balance both the material. Similarly, Cut also, like so whenever we like a, we need to make a cutting for a road or a railway, we need retaining walls. Similarly, hill roads, the cut side also we have to retain many times. If it is rock, it may be stable, but if it is even if it is weathered rock also or soil, we will need a retaining structure. Then uh, coming to the basic air pressure, there are three types of air pressure. We might have some idea like what we call air pressure at rest, active air pressure, and passive air pressure. This depends on the movement. Like, like if we have a retaining structure and it doesn't move at all, like there is absolutely no movement, then the air pressure exerted by the soil is called air pressure at rest because the soil is at rest, it doesn't move. An example is like a basement wall. Suppose like we have a like a RCC wall which is supported by uh, RCC slabs at different levels. Like Then the wall cannot move, it cannot slide or rotate. So we can expect the soil will exert a pressure at rest. Again, this is related to the friction angle. So we have a simple formula, like call it K0 is equal to one minus sine phi. Then uh, many cases, like we have this wall, like it is not uh, supported by anything else. Then the soil tends to push the wall away from the soil. That means the wall tends to move away from the earth. In this case, we call it active earth pressure because the soil is trying to push the wall away from it. So here, the earth pressure coefficient will be this, like one minus sine phi by one plus sine phi, where phi is the angle of internal friction of the soil. Then there may be some situations the wall is pushed towards the earth. Actually, so one example like is a bridge abutment. Like the this is the abutment and the bridge deck is resting over that, supported over that. If the bridge deck expands due to when it when uh, temperature increases, it expands. So in that it will push the retaining wall towards the soil. So this retaining wall will experience passive earth pressure. So this is given by Kp coefficient of passive air pressure, which is given by this formula. And again, to mobilize this active or passive condition, some movement will be required. So if absolutely there is no movement, it will be a pressure of rest given by K0. And for a normal soil, we can take phi is equal to 30 degrees. So Ka will be 0.33. So Ka0 will be 0 0.5, because it is one minus sine phi. And if the wall moves away from the soil, the air pressure will reduce. Then after a small movement, it will become this K. It becomes constant actually. So if you look at here, to mobilize the active state, only a small movement is required. Like that K. But if the wall is pushed towards the soil, the passive condition, but if you can see here, large movement will be required to mobilize the passive state. Of course, the passive earth pressure will be much more. It is so this, all this have implications in the design of retaining structures. So now let us look at what are the different types of retaining structures. And again, we uh, look at the equilibrium I, uh, I mentioned to understand. So I mentioned this wedge is not an equilibrium. 
there is an unbalanced force which we call the active work pressure. So to keep this wedge in equilibrium, I have to supply an equal and opposite force. So this can be done in different ways. See, one way is to build a retaining wall outside. This is what normally we do. We construct a, either a like a gravity wall or a RCC cantilever wall. So when we construct the wall, actually it applies this force on the outside. So these type of retaining walls are called externally stabilized structures. It's, that means we are applying the the, the counter force from the outside or externally. So like the, the common type of retaining walls like mass gravity, which is masonry, PCC, ABNs, etc. Or RCC, cantilever, counter force, but rest. Even what we call embedded, like sheet piles, boat pile walls, diaphragm walls, all these are externally stabilized systems because we are supplying this uh, the equilibrium force from the outside. Then, uh, another option is, see, instead of uh, like constructing a retaining wall from the outside, can I like uh, stabilize the soil by putting some reinforcing within the soil? Like, so that means we are internally stabilizing the soil. So these are called internally stabilized retaining structure. So uh, examples are like reinforced soil wall. Like if you are doing filling, we can put like geogrids or geotextiles in different layers. So See, when this wedge is trying to move out, it is being resisted by the reinforcements. There is a friction between friction or bond between the soil and reinforcement. So movement is resisted. In that process, tension will be mobilized in the re reinforcement. So the tension will be resisted by this embedded portion, which is called the resistant portion. So if you add up all the tensions, that will be equal to this unbalanced force. So the concept is same, like either from, we have to supply this much force, either from the outside or from the inside. So these are internally stabilized retaining structures. So we have a third type, like sometimes we have certain type, like the, 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 the equilibrium force is supplied partly from the outside and partly from the inside. So one example is a anchored sheet pile wall. So the sheet pile will be embedded. So partly because of the passive resistance, it supports on the outside and the anchors stabilize it from the inside. So we have basically these three categories depending on how the, the, the wedge is kept in equilibrium. Now let us look at the each type one by one. One is the mass gravity retaining wall. So here the basic concept is very simple. Let's go back to that block actually. So I have a block which is resting on a table. So if I apply a horizontal force, it has certain, because to move the block, I have to apply a certain force. Actually. So the resistance is the coefficient of friction into whatever normal force, which is the weight of the block. So suppose like mu is equal to 0 0.5. So the resistance is 0.5 into the weight of the block. That is the maximum horizontal force I can apply. So when I apply that much force, it will slide away like that. So what a mass gravity retaining wall does is exactly the same. Like we know the earth pressure will be something like a triangle. Like earlier, it will be active earth pressure now because the soil is trying to push the wall away. So uh, depending on the phi value of the soil, we'll have a KA value. So KA into gamma H will be the active earth pressure at the base. It will be a triangular distribution. So the total horizontal thrust will be the area of this triangle, which is 0.5 KA gamma H squared. So if you have a certain height of earth to be retained, and how does the wall resist? See, the wall is either it will be, the, the pressure is trying to push it away, so it will slide or it will overturn. And the only way it can resist is by its own, weight actually. Like that. So because of the weight, the friction is mobilized at the base, it resists sliding. Similarly, by its own weight, like that, it tries to rotate about the toe, the, the, the lateral pressure gives a overturning moment, similarly the weight gives a counter moment, resisting moment. So it's, it's an equilibrium. Moment. So this type of retaining wall resists the earth pressure purely by its weight. Actually. So that is why it's called mass gravity. And again, once so to resist the earth pressure, we have to supply sufficient weight. Actually. So when the height increases, we can see the horizontal thrust increases. So only way I can resist is I have to increase the weight. That means because the height is fixed, I have to increase the width. 
So the width will be proportional to the high returns. And another important is this type of retaining walls are constructed with materials without tensile strength, like uh, either masonry or plain cement concrete. So it doesn't have any tensile strength, so we cannot allow any tension to develop within the retaining structure. So again, the width has to be sufficient so that the no tension condition is maintained. Or we follow the rule like that, the resultant, that means we have a vertical force and we have a horizontal force, that resultant has to be within the middle third. There are different types of mass gravity depending on the materials like uh, various types. So, so normally I mentioned that a pressure is like a triangle. So that means theoretical shape could be a triangle, but for practical reasons, we need some minimum width at the top. Then depending on the weight required, we increase the width towards the bottom. Like that's how this shape comes. And to avoid bearing failure, it is always good to give a footing at the base. This is basically it will have a trapezoidal shape. Okay. And we can have dry rubble masonry, we can have RR masonry, even plain cement concrete, actually. So basically the, the dimensions will be more or less the same actually, in all these cases, because the way of, of course the, the, the unit weight will be slightly different. So here we can see this is slightly tilted. See, probably the, the dimensions were not sufficient to resist the application or probably the, the pressure has increased by because of rain or water collecting behind this. Another type of is uh, gravity wall is what is known as segmental concrete block retaining walls. This is uh, very popular in more advanced countries, especially US. So these are made of small precast concrete blocks, actually, you can see, and with interlocking type. And it is plain cement concrete. There is no steel inside. This is made by block making machines. So we have a very relatively uh, zero slum concrete, which is put into the mold and then pressed. There is a, with a hydrostatic pressure plus vibration. Then it is cured and then uh, like it can be stacked. It will have a, uh, like a, like a shear connection like that, tongue and groove type joint, or it could have pins like that. So very simple to construct. And we know like in abroad, like a lot of people, like they do what is known as do it yourself. They will construct the retaining wall themselves. So this doesn't need any motor and it's more or less self aligning like easy to construct. And the main uh, thing is here is the, the look wise. See, mostly this will be used in landscaping where it has to look really good. So we can have different types of finish, color, etc., different patterns and sometimes like we can, uh, the, the, it is like a double block and the next day, mostly after the final set, it can be split actually. So when, where that split, it looks very rough and it looks like natural stone. Like, so whichever type of finish you need, there are a lot of options. So only problem is like, we cannot go to large heights actually, because the width is less. So maybe something like a small, like one meter, one and a half meter type of thing, like it can be used. But if you want to go for larger heights, we can reinforce with geogrids that we'll see later. Then there are crib, like the crib is nothing like a, like a box-like structure. It can be made of precast concrete. It can be made of timber, even like uh, the old tires, like uh, the tires which we can throw away that can be filled with gravel, it can be stacked. And some people even use this MD, the bitumen drums like that. So these are all like, uh, it will be filled with mostly stone because it will be good for drainage also. Another uh, now which is becoming very popular is gabion retaining walls. Like uh, so, like if you look at the gabion mesh, is made of first. If you look at the wire, like there will be a steel wire, maybe something like two point seven three to four mm dia steel wire, and it will be galvanized. That means there will be a zinc coating is to prevent corrosion like that. And some applications, this is enough actually, if uh, like the environment is like uh, not very corrosive, maybe the galvanization will be sufficient. But if the environment is more aggressive, like if it is like a river bank, it is exposed to water or a corrosive environment, normally they will provide a PVC coating also, or even L chloride, which is normally half of them. So we have this wire from that, with this machine, we form the gabion mesh. And here we have what is known as a 
double twisting link. So like if we can compare with this normal, what we call the chain link mesh, so there is only one twist. So if by chance the wire gets cut, this will unravel, the mesh becomes unstable. Whereas here, even if the wire cut, it will remain stable. So that is the idea of the double twist. And this aperture, the shape is like an hexagon. So sometimes it's called hexagonally woven double strip wire mesh. So now the mesh will be cut into the required length and we can make this box. Actually, this is made in the factory. So suppose this is like a two by one by one. So base piece is two meter length and one meter width. So this is a one meter by one meter piece. So sides, bottom like that. So inside there'll be one diaphragm also. Like so, so normally we want to have the cells into one meter by one meter to one meter side. So all this will be laced with wire. So same type of wire will be used. Maybe only slightly different diameter like that. Same type of wire is lacing. So all this, then it can be folded like. So first this will be folded, then this like this, like this. So this will be folded like that then it can be sent to the side. Then at the side, we close this box and this again, these sides will be uh, tied with the lacing wire. This will be fixed, except the lid will be open. So we can see that. So we can see that it is not that, it is not a very strong box. It's a very flexible, like it's a very light structure. As such, the box itself will not have any strength, not much strength. Only if it is filled with stone only, it becomes strength. So then we can fill the stone, then tie the lid like that again with the lacing wire. Then this uh, gabions will be stacked actually. So, so the normally the first, the first layer of boxes will be arranged, then it will be filled with stone, then tied. Then the next layer of boxes will be assembled, filled with stone like that. So here, the, as I mentioned, the Gabion box is not a very strong, like it's a very light mesh, flexible structure. So the main strength comes from the interlocking of the stone. Actually. So the stone has to be, be carefully placed, at least on the exposed face, it has to be interlocked otherwise. Sometimes the stone is just dumped, and you can see this Gabion sub bulge actually. Because if you just dump it inside the, because this mesh, as I mentioned, is very flexible actually. It's not a very rigid box. So placing is very important. So this is a bit labor intensive. Like, so that is, so there are advantages, disadvantages. Advantages is very flexible. Then drainage is very good because it is filled with stone. It is uh, good. And even if it settles, nothing much will happen. It can accommodate a fairly large amount of settlement. But then it is a bit labor intensive actually like that. Again, uh, while filling, we have to do bracing. See, normally what people do at one third height and two third height, the internally, again with the lacing wire, it has to be cross braced actually, so that it doesn't bulge out. So all these precautions have to be taken during construction. And it can be stacked in different ways actually. Like, uh, see, depending on the height of the wall, we have to determine the base width. And the dimensions has to be decided. So we can have the front face, and normally, uh, like see, normally to increase the sliding resistance, the base will be placed at a slight inclination, something like up to six degrees is good. For so that it will have more sliding resistance. So we can have slight setback that is possible. Or we can have more setback. So depending on the site conditions, the loop we want to have like that, the, the configuration. And another very interesting material nowadays we have is geocell. So this geocell is like a honeycomb type of structure. So it will be made by welding strips of high density polyethylene. There are other materials also, but commonly used is high density polyethylene. You can see the strips, they'll be arranged in parallel and at intermittent, it will be welded, ultrasonic welding. So it comes a honeycomb structure, then it can be collapsed and made into bundles and sent to side. And when it comes to the site, it is just expanded and it can be filled with soil. It can be filled with aggregate. It can be filled with concrete. So it's a very versatile material. So it can be used to construct retaining walls. Like, so again, uh, same concept like gabions because, but here we can fill soil also. So again, depending on the design of the wall, the width we have to, each layer, uh, the width we have to decide. 
then it can be filled with uh, soil or aggregate and we can have vegetation also in the Again, a very versatile material, very easy to construct. Uh, we don't need any special machinery. So that was about mass gravity retaining walls. Now let us come to the RCC retaining walls. So I have called it again RCC gravity. I'll explain why. So let us look at the mass gravity retaining wall once again. So as I mentioned, it resists the earth pressure purely by its weight, actually. So as, I, the, as the height increases, I have to uh, increase the weight, that means I have to increase the width actually. So I have to use more material, like more masonry, more concrete, like that. So more gabions. So beyond a height, maybe something like four meters, five meters, this becomes uneconomical. These are not economical for large weights. So what do we do? So, so like, see, the basic idea is, as I mentioned, to get the, so there is an air pressure, the soil applies an air pressure, and to resist, we need a certain weight actually. So, like uh, we ask, so can I? So, so here we can see the the outline of the mass gravity wall. So, let us ask, can I replace part of like uh, plain concrete or uh, masonry by soil? Because uh, soil is much cheaper than stone or concrete. Because after all, we need what is weight to resist the air pressure. So, I remove this much concrete. I have seen like this much concrete. I have removed so i got a, our cantilever rcc wall so the soil above the base lab plus this will have sufficient weight to resist the air pressure so it becomes stable but now we have a problem so my stem it has become very thin actually so we know now tension will develop it will be uh, subjected to bending and shear so now, if the stem has to be stable, I have to provide steel reinforcement. Similarly, the base lab is also thin. Like to resist bending and shear, we have to put reinforcement. So we have to give the reinforcement. This shows the main steel only. Like other side also, we have to put the distribution steel. So now what happens, like if uh, the height increases, again, the I have to increase the width because bending moment shear force increase. So I have to increase the thickness of the stem actually. So beyond the height, maybe around eight meter, nine meter, uh, this becomes uneconomical actually. Because what happens, like we have three cantilevers, like the stem is a cantilever, this is a cantilever, this is a cantilever. So as the span increases, like as the height increases, this span increases, I have to increase the length also. This span also increases. So that means I have to use more and more concrete. So we go to the next step, like a counterfold. Like if you have a like a large hall and we have to put a slab, we know like if you put a slab only, the slab has to be very thick. So to economize what we do, we put some beams, intermediate beams, so that the span of the slab has reduced. So the cost of beam will be extra, but overall it becomes more economical. So same thing we do here. So we put this counterfort in between at the spacings. So now the slab spans between this counterfort. So it can be thinner like that. So it becomes overall economical. So normally the counterfort are provided the inside. That means the soil side of the fill side. So we can see here, both side retaining wall. If we provide the support from the outside, we call it buttress. These are buttress. So that means this is a soil side, this is the yeah. outside. So normally this type will not be as much efficient as the counterfort because actually here what happens, the like the, the weight of the soil adds to stability, whereas here will be less. See again, uh, the counterfort wall, see up to maybe 12 meter or even up to 15 meters, it's okay. So beyond that, it becomes uneconomical. So again, so suppose I have a 20 meter or 30 meter or a 40 meter high retaining wall, what do we do? Fortunately, now we have this uh, reinforced soil retaining wall option. As I mentioned, uh, it is an internally stabilized system. So let us uh, like, uh, so earlier we have seen, we had the mass gravity wall, like a PCC. From that, we came to the RCC cantilever wall, like we have removed lot of concrete, this, this much concrete we removed, but we have to put steel inside this. 
Okay, now from this cantilever, let us go to the reinforced soil wall. So again, uh, I have seen the outline of the cantilever wall. You can see this red hash line that is the outline of the cantilever wall. So it has again a lot of concrete. So if I uh, if I want to design a tall wall, I will use a lot of concrete, which is very expensive. So let's ask a question like, uh, can we reduce the concrete still? So what I do, I take away this base lab completely. Like that, I take away the base lab. Then in the stem, I I just leave a thin concrete only, like maybe like a, uh, like a 15 centimeters or 18 centimeters only, and remove most of the stem concrete actually. So now, then I put reinforcement inside, like the geosmetic reinforcement. I can put geocrete, I can put geotextile, I can put steel strips, different types of reinforcement, and stabilize this block. See, now this block is stabilized, actually. So this becomes a gravity wall, like a mass gravity wall. Only difference is, instead of making it with masonry or concrete, we have made it with soil or reinforced soil. So this is the basic principle of reinforced soil. We are internally stabilizing it. So, so first, uh, if we look at simple design, first I have to determine because depending on the height and the five value density of the soil, there is a pressure to be resisted. To resist that, I need a certain weight actually. So that means I, have to, I need a certain width of soil. So that determines how long should be my reinforcement. So, so that we call external stability, which is same as for a gravity wall. Then this block has to be internally stable. Like just like in the, the cantilever wall, we have to put the steel reinforcement to stress, resist bending and shear. In the same way, we have to reinforce the soil to resist. So for that, from that, we design what should be the strength of the reinforcement, what should be the spacing like that, which is called the internal stability. So, so if you look at uh, uh, a reinforced soil wall, it will have various components. The first I mentioned is the soil reinforcement, which stabilizes the soil block. So this uh, always, please remember, sometimes what happens, uh, like we know, like the concrete is a structural material. So sometimes a lot of people think this is the retaining wall, like this facing, but this is only a facing. This entire block, that is the retaining wall. Like, never forget that actually. So the soil is also a very important component of this reinforcement. Like in reinforced concrete, we have concrete and the reinforcement. In the same way, in reinforced soil, the reinforcement and soil, both are structural materials, both are equally important. Then we have a facing. Then there will be a connection between the reinforcement and the facing. We'll have a drainage layer like that. There will be a small leveling pad. This is only to provide a level platform to erect the facing. Sometimes we have a crash barrier, etc. So uh, a beauty of reinforced soil is that we have uh, so many different types of materials. For soil reinforcement, we have uh, two broad categories. One is metallic, which we can have steel strips, welded bar mat, welded wear mesh, even the gabion mesh can be used. Then coming to polymeric, we have geogrids, geotextiles, or geostrips or straps. Different types of materials are there. For the facing also, we have a wide, uh, lot of options actually. So uh, like what it does to the designer is it gives an enormous range of choice, like different types of reinforcement, different types of facing, so which we can compare and have a optimal solution for a particular site. Because each site will have its own problems, its own requirements. So the more the choice we have, we can have a better solution. So the facing, we can have, uh, these are actually small concrete blocks, precast concrete blocks. These are precast concrete panels. So here, this is actually a welded wire steel mesh with stone, actually. I will show the details later. And here, like we can have vegetation, actually. Inside, there will be reinforced, uh, soil reinforcement will be there, but everything is covered by vegetation. For hill areas, hill roads, this is a very good solution. Whereas if it is a city, we can look for this type of solutions. So like uh, with the panel facing, these are all actually what are known as discrete panel. Like it will be something like width will be 1.5 meter, height will be 1.5, 1.6 meter. We can have different shapes. Inside we can see the geogrid reinforcement. 
it is connected to the panel with a hook actually steel hooks again this has to be galvanized we have different connection arrangements and construction is also very simple one advantage is like all these are precast actually so there is no waiting period like in a different precasting yard it will be cast and it will be brought here and erected and it doesn't need any propping from the outside only the first row has to be propped after that we have this clamping mechanism it becomes self supporting so in a city flyover we know like we have to have the traffic going this way so we cannot uh, obstruct the road with a lot of propping actually so it's a very good system We can also have, uh, instead of panels, we can use small concrete blocks. So these are just uh, stacked one above the above, other. And normally, every 0.6 meter or so vertically, we'll have a layer of uh, reinforcement. Should be, in this case, this is geogrid. We can also have geotextiles. And the connection is simply by friction. So that means, the uh, so we have a layer of blocks. We put the geogrid, put the next layer of the blocks above. And purely by the friction, it holds actually. But only it has to be designed. Like uh, it has to be tested. So there is a procedure for doing a connection strength test. Then, then we have to calculate the, what is the force coming here. And we have to ensure that there is a sufficient factor. Sir. There are also systems with a mechanical connection with uh, different type of devices are there. Suppose I don't want to use concrete panels or blocks. I can go with this type of system, which is a welded wire mesh. So this is steel welded wire mesh bent into an L shape. So this width will be something like 0.5 to 0.6 meter. Height can be 0.5 to 0.6 meter. And we have this diagonal struts to keep this in place. And here, what we know as a wraparound facing, like we have the geocentric reinforcement, which comes like this, then goes up and again goes back, minimum around one meter into the fill to anchor it like that. And we can, uh, then the soil is filled, we have this, we can see this uh, welded wire mesh, the geosynthetic wrap around, then we can grow vegetation, so the entire thing is covered. Actually. So where the climate is favorable, like we have reasonable good rainfall, it is not very hot and dry, we can go for a vegetation. But we have a lot of areas, especially in India, like. Uh, we yeah, have very hot and dry climates. So there we can go for this type of system. I have shown a picture earlier also. The same type of welded wire mesh, like and with the strut. So behind we put some stone, maybe half a meter or 0.6 meter wide portion. We put the stone, just like uh, something like Gabion. But only thing is, it's not a fully enclosed box like that. It's only L shape like that. Then we have this geocentric reinforcement. So this is actually a flyover in Delhi. Like the height is 15.5 uh, meters. So it is not 90 degree, something like 5 degree inclination is there, almost 85 degree. So you can see the, the kind of height. And uh, look at the facing, it is only a very flexible welded wire mesh with a half a meter thick stone. But the main load is carried by the geograms. Geogra This shows a 46 meter high reinforced soil wall in, uh, like it is again for a airport in USA. So almost vertical, only it is in four tires, like one, two, three, four, with a small setback. Still more or less very, very, like you can see, almost vertical, you can see. And the, the reinforcement was steel strip. In India also, we have done some huge structures. So this was uh, the famous uh, Pakyong Airport in Sikkim, which is in a hilly area. To then to get the required runway length, they have to do a lot of filling. Uh, the height of filling was something like 74 meter. But it is not 90 degree. Somewhere it is maybe like 60 degrees, 70, 75, like that. It varies actually. But still a very, very steep structure. And imagine it is 74 meter high. Like, uh, uh, can we imagine constructing something like this? Our uh, uh, mass gravity or RCC will not be possible at all. And we have another option, what we call reinforced soil slope. Actually, normally the retaining wall is something like 90 degrees. So normally, a reinforced soil wall, if it is steeper than 70 degrees, we call it a wall and is designed as a 
retaining wall using the pressure theories. But if it is less than 70 degree, if the inclination, then the disintegrates is slow. So again, the design, the same concept, like uh, we have to internally stabilize, but if the design procedure is slightly different, we use the slope stability analysis technique. So like we can have any angle now, like it's not that we have to go for 90 degree, like, like if you have space for 35 degree, we can decide with 35, 45, 60, 70, any angle, depending on the space available, we can decide it. So this is one more option we should always consider, like don't directly go for the retaining one, always the, explore the possibility of a reinforced soil slope. And remember all these are when we are doing filling actually. These are not suitable for cuts. Cuts, we have different options, we'll come to that. So please remember reinforced soil technique is always for fill. Wherever we are doing filling, this is an option. So this was a 40, feet, 40 meter high reinforced soil slope uh, for the Shillong bypass. So, so normally like it's a hill road, so like we have to widen, like, uh, like suppose we want to widen it to four lane. So one option is to cut the hillside or we have to do filling actually. So when we do filling, then we have to start from the bottom actually, from the valley floor. And, so the height is around 40 meters. Same, like uh, I told about the wraparound type of uh, construction was used. Uh, I used the geogrid. And because here yeah, the climate is very conducive, there, like the temperature is not very high. They'll have uh, rainfall throughout the year, so the vegetation will establish. So we can see the vegetation is slowly growing. So now it will be like later on, within a few months' time, it will be covered with dense vegetation. So, so far, uh, the retaining walls which we have looked like the mass gravity, RCC, uh, the reinforced soil, these are all suitable when we are doing filling. So wherever we are doing filling, these are the options like uh, either mass gravity or RCC gravity, uh, retaining walls, reinforced soil walls, or we can look at reinforced soil slopes also. A lot of places we need to stabilize cut slopes or excavations. So there like we have again a range of choices. So one is embedded retaining wall. So here these are like, if you look at the, the, the mass gravity walls are very thick actually, very massive because they resist the earth pressure by its own self weight. That means to resist sliding and overturning, it has to depend only on its own weight. So that means the, the structure has to be massive actually. Similarly, even if it is RCC, the base slab has to have sufficient width so that it, uh, uh, like uh, the soil, the weight of soil and the wall together, it can resist the applied forces. In the case of embedded retaining walls, it is relatively slender, like the thickness is not much, but it is embedded for sufficient length into the ground, actually. So it derives its resistance from embedment. That means in this portion, passive earth pressure is mobilized. So uh, uh, resistance to sliding and overturning is by the, the soil pressure mobilized in this embedded portion. That's why they call it embedded retaining walls. So we can have two options. One is cantilever. So that means uh, the it um, uh, derives its resistance purely from embedment, actually. So this is like a cantilever beam or slab. Like. So for small heights, it's okay, like three meters or even up to five meters, say, this is, uh, it can be managed, but when the height is more, like it becomes uneconomical because we have to use a lot of material because it has to be very thick. So we use, uh, we end up using a lot of expensive material. Also the deflections may be too much. So there we go for this angered system, right? So here it is like a, uh, like a uh, mixed system, partially from embedment and partially from anchorages. So the anchorage could be like a dead man, like a concrete block, or we can go for like, a, we can drill a hole, introduce a tendon and grout it, like grouted tie bags, various types of anchors. Can be at one level or two level or three level, any number of levels, we can give the anchorages. So, we have uh, uh, four major type of embedded retaining structures. One is sheet piles. Then we have something known as soldier piles and lagging system. These are both driven. That means these are driven into the soil. 
then we have board pile and diaphragm walls which are like if we either drill a hole or a trench and uh, pour concrete so casting stone and all these types either we can have cantilever or anchored or prop so sheet piles uh, like it can be made of uh, steel concrete or even timber but still sheet piles are more popular so like, this shows a cantilever this shows anchored like here like one row of anchors we can see and we can see like second row of anchors being installed different configurations one type is u type this uh, sheet pile section shape is like a u then we have this facility for interlocking when you construct like that this one place like this one like that this up uh, interlock another common shape is z like this uh, shape like an z like that again this shows is a proper and there are like uh, different like there is a hat type session then uh, like z and h can be combined together like that suppose we want a very uh, we want more resistance like even a deep wall we can have a combination of session sections as possible and again these are driven by like um, like probably impact hammer vibro hammer or even by static push then sometimes uh, we do jetting to Penetration easier, and of course, corrosion is an important criteria. Like because steel it gets corroded, so so normally we give a sacrificial thickness or sometimes a protective coating or even like uh, what we call cathodic protection. Different techniques. Another system is what we call soldier pile wall. So here, like these are soldier piles, commonly used as a steel edge section. Like first, this is driven into the soil. and this lagging it could be like a timber wooden planks or small concrete slabs which are put and as the soil is excavated this lagging is put like that the so steel edge sections and the concrete planks which are put so these are also called king post wall or berlin walls like even for like uh, excavations basement construction still so sometimes in strata it may be difficult to drive the steel edge sections so another option is we can uh, drill a hole then put this um, steel edge section there and uh, fill it with concrete up to this portion bottom portion and above this lagging will be there so only up to this bottom it will be excavated like that so this portion gives the embedment and gives the strength to the another type of same soldier pile system is what we call the pile and slab which is uh, like we see it many places in and around cochin especially for the waterways and canals it is very popular so here we see the precast concrete piles so these are driven to the required depth to give stability then like as we keep excavating we put this uh, slabs with precast concrete slabs to retain the soil say so, so this uh, facility in tevera this construction was going on we like it was not going very smoothly like uh, the problem was like a very soft clay there we uh, you can see the pile and slab here then they trying to anchor it like with some anchor slabs even this was moving so they put try to put uh, coconut pile to hold this anchor slab like in soft clay can be problematic like and here we see the precast piles the bottom is pointed to be driving and here we have a like a horizontal bracket type of thing so up to this it will be driven and over this the concrete slabs then we have board pile retaining walls like a series of piles can be installed and uh, like uh, many of us will recall the the bothis failure which happened in kalu so here we have different configurations like second piles tangent piles contiguous with some small gap also depending on how much water type is required the type of soil condition we can have which is the best suited configuration then the diaphragm wall similar to like boat pile only instead of uh, drilling a circular hole we drill a rectangular trench like that 
Then again, this will be filled with bentonite slurry to stabilize the sides. Then steel reinforcement will be put and it will be concreted with trimming. Then we'll go to the next session like that. There is uh, like different, like, uh, like, uh, and with alternating or successive different options are available. And again, it can be cantilevered or anchored. So here we can see the anchored diaphragm walls. So again, it could be temporary, could be permanent. Like then uh, another option is soil nailing, again for cuts. So here the concept is, suppose I want to excavate, uh, we know this will be like this failure will occur. So I stabilize very similar to the reinforced soil concept. Like I put the reinforcement. So only difference is in the case of soil reinforcement, uh, reinforced soil, it was in the filling. Like when we are doing filling, we can put the reinforcement. But whereas uh, if it is when we are doing a cut, we have to put the reinforcement into the existing ground. There are two options. One is we can drive a steel bar inside. Otherwise, we first drill a hole put a steel bar and grout it like which is more common way. So here we can see like this part actually resists pull out. This is the passive resisting zone. This is the active zone. So this part is trying to move away, which is being resisted by this pull out resistance here. In the process, this developed tension. So the construction sequence, like uh, see normally in the filling, what we do, we go from bottom. We start at the bottom, go to the top. Whereas in the cut, Top down actually. We start from the top, like a single ground. We make an excavation like somewhere like three to five feet. So that means at least this much it has to be temporarily stable till this nails are installed. So that is a one condition for soil nailing. If it is dry sand, it will be very difficult because we know like even this much will not stand in collapse. So soil has, should have some apparent cohesion so that it is stable for at least for some time. We excavate, then we drill a hole. Then insert the steel bar, we grout it. Then there will be a drainage net will be there. Then we put a welded wire mesh and put a short rig there to sterilize this. Then go to the next stage, like that again, put one more nail, grout, short rig. Then go to the next phase, one more nail, like that stage by stage, we'll go like that. Then after the finishing, we put one more layer of short grade, build environment and short grade, give the final facing. Or there are also other options. We can also fix like precast concrete panels that are also possible. So this shows the details. So it is slightly inclined so that, uh, let's see normally the grout from flows from here to here. So with this way, there'll not be any cavities actually. It is entirely filled. And the grout has two functions. One is to give good bond resistance with the soil. Because nail has to resist pull out. So it has to develop good friction with the soil. So when you put grout, it develops good bond with the soil. Secondly, it provides corrosion protection for the soil nail, the steel bar. So this shows the detail of the facing. Like so this is the soil face. So then we'll have a drainage. See, normally nowadays we have this geocomposite drains, so strips are placed at intervals. Then uh, there will be a layer of uh, welded wire mesh, then first layer of short grid. Then there will be like a uh, bearing plate and a nut and a, uh, sorry, nut and will be placed tighten like that. So we can see this headed stud actually. So when we place the next layer of uh, short grid, it connects both these two. Like that. So it becomes monolithic. Then after that, one more layer of uh, reinforcement and again short grid. Or we can give for other type panel or something like that. So the look wise, it not be very attractive, like a short read finish. Uh, it may not look not very aesthetically pleasing. So like we can combine, like uh, I mentioned, like soil nail with uh, reinforced soil. These are called hybrid systems. So here, this was the original ground profile. So I have to excavate and make a road here. So this part is with soil nailing. Then actually I have to fill here and make another road here actually. So this part will be with the reinforced soil because we are doing filling. This combination is possible. Then another situation we face is a hill road, like existing. So we have a narrow road, which we have to widen. Like that. So either we go cut this side or we have to do filling this side. So when we do filling, one very good option is to go for reinforced soil. 
but then the problem is reinforced soil has to uh, it requires certain length of reinforcement at least 0.7 times this height so if i have to provide that much length i have to cut this much excavate this much that means my road is gone so where will the vehicles go so now we have this what is known as showed msc wall so msc wall is simply means mechanically stabilized earth another name for reinforced soil so i excavate here like i don't disturb the existing road so i start cutting here then do soil nailing like that first i keep excavate do nail excavate do nail then reach here then i do filling like with the reinforced soil so now this part is entirely stable actually so it doesn't apply any earth pressure so that means i can reduce the width of the reinforcement i can have a narrow bed and if required i can connect the reinforcement with this with a suitable system it can be connected also like so like a, it's a for this kind of application it's a very good system so this is uh, the system i have seen recently i saw the this is not the final design probably it's only the concept design which is in the detailed project report uh, this is what the nh17 polangeri bypass like widening so this is the existing ground level so like the road level is at below so we have to cut so what they proposed is soil nailing then like concept is they will excavate put soil nails like this then uh then they construct a like a narrow reinforced soil wall like that so because i don't know what is the logic behind this i don't know why do we think because there is no road here actually it's a narrow width only so either it is to have a good finish or i don't know like otherwise they could have just had the soil nailing only like there was no need of for this so i am i really don't know what is the logic behind that only the designer will know so another type is breast wall like uh, see the difference between retaining wall and breast wall is this the the retaining wall retains the fill like this portion like suppose i have a hill road so i have to cut the hill slide and then fill up this valley side so for this i will construct a retaining wall tunnel type so here what we call a breast wall see the breast wall is put directly against the cut actually there is no back fill so we can call it's a special type of retaining wall in which it is used to stabilize cuts then the retaining wall is breast wall is placed directly against the cut slope there is no back fill then the retained material should be reasonably competent like it should have some cohesion like it should be like a compact hard residual soil or something like laterite or weathered rock because the width is much less compared to normal retaining wall and this is usually designed based on experience based on thumb rows typical like all hill roads will have this press stones like they probably on the river to in the key or even why not like everywhere you will have this type of press stones it could be like a uh, different types it could be again masonry could be concrete gabion and we can see the width actually the base width is only 0.3 to 0.35 so here even like 0.25 like that whereas a normal retaining wall which retains fill we need at least say 0.6 or even in some cases 0.7 times the height so this will work only when the strata is very stable like that so like one common mistake sometimes people do is so people have this standard drawings actually so like okay 0.3 times the height as the base width so if i uh, so wherever wherever i am doing filling if i try to construct this then we may have problems actually so this was one case like uh, this was actually around probably around 8 meter high retaining wall and it was filling actually but somehow the designer he put uh, gave a much less width only around 0.3 0.35 times the height only the base width was there so when i check the factor safety the factor safety was less than 1 for both for overturning actually so no wonder it failed probably initially it was stable because the soil was not saturated so it will have some apparent cohesion but after the rains when the soil becomes totally saturated so that apparent cohesion is lost that pressure increases and the wall collapses so which wall to use where we have to be very careful it has to be properly designed
So I come to the last uh, like one is important topic is drainage. I'll just take another probably five to six minutes only. So like uh, so normally during monsoon, many times we read in the newspapers like somewhere like uh, the retaining wall collapsed, compound wall collapsed, and people living down. They were sleeping in their homes, but then huge mass of earth fall there and they died like that. So what happens? So so how does water affect the stability of earth retaining structures? See, one is when water enters the soil, it increases the unit weight. Then uh, the loss of suction, we will see what it is. Increasing pore pressure, and if water flows, the seepage pressure is there. And sometimes when water flows, it causes internal erosion. And of course, liquefaction problem is there. Then sometimes, uh, especially in reinforced soil structures with metallic reinforcement, corrosion is a problem. When water is there, corrosion is more. So if I look at the increase in unit weight, I have roughly tried to calculate, like assuming like uh, uh, you know, this formula for unit weight, if it is dry soil, certain assumptions, 18.6 per newton per mm. So if you uh, if the soil becomes completely saturated, then the degree of saturation becomes one. So it becomes 21.4. That means the weight will increase by 15%. So air pressure is Ka into gamma into H. So the air pressure also will increase by 15%. Okay, but it will not be, see normally uh, retaining walls, we design for a factor safety of 1.4 for sliding and two for overturning. So this, will, this is not going to cause a failure like that. Another important effect is loss of suction. See, a simple example is like if you take some clay, uh, if it is very wet, it becomes very low, it's very soft actually. But if you put it in the sun, if you observe after some time, it becomes stronger, it becomes slightly harder like that. So, but if you put it into an oven and heat it overnight, it becomes a very hard lump like that. And again, if you put that hard lump into water, what happens? It again becomes mud and soft. So, so when the soil is dry, it appears as if there is some cohesion, but it is not permanent. Like, like when you put that dry lump of clay into water, it disintegrates like that. But a concrete or even a brick, which is a fire burn brick, will not disintegrate, which means it has permanent cohesion. Whereas soil, it has only apparent cohesion. Whatever is cohesion, it's only, it is only apparent. So mainly, it is caused by the water film. Like when uh, the soil grains has a film of water around that. So when the soil is not saturated, that film is in tension. We have the surface tension actually. So in the case of sand, the surface tension developed, the suction developed is very less. But still, when the soil is wet, sand is slightly moist, we know like, uh, like it can uh, stand at steep angle. Like, uh, if we, even we can make a small tunnel inside like that. We can do some sculptures. Like, normally people go to the beach and do like when the sand is wet like that. But if the sand is completely submerged or the sand is perfectly dry, it will not have that cohesion. But in the case of clays, the, the, the clays, the, the particles are plate-like and they also have a net negative charge. So they have a strong attraction for water. So in the case of fine grain soils like clays, it can develop very high suction. And again, remember this is temporary like it, is, it will be there only when the soil is unsaturated. The moment it becomes saturated, submerged, that will be lost. So some slopes, uh, <clears throat> if it is a stiff clay, like we can make an excavation, like we can make a vertical cut. It will remain stable, maybe sometimes a few months, sometimes in up to years, but slowly with the time, it will start failing. So when uh, it will lose suction. Then we have the hydrostatic pressure. So again, uh, if you do a simple calculation, like if you took uh, like a soil which is not saturated, if I, if I get the phi of 32, then K will be 0.3. Then gamma, let us assume 20 kilonewton per m cube. So 0.3 into 20 becomes six. So the air pressure at a will be six times the height. If you look at submerged, so now I have looked at the sum, due to the submerged soil, air pressure will be gamma dash, which is 20 minus 10, which is 10. So air pressure will be three times H. 
Then in addition, there will be the hydrostatic pressure, which is equal to gamma W, which is 10 into H. So together, it will have 13 H. So compared to an unsaturated soil, in the case of a submerged one with hydrostatic pressure, the total pressure, lateral F pressure, that means the pressure of the submerged soil plus hydrostatic pressure is two times this. So we know that so our normal factor of safety is sliding is only 1.5 or turning is 2. So if, if we have designed the wall for this, and if it rains and water accumulates, the wall is going to fail. So like uh, it is uh, drainage is very important. So we can uh, like we can have various options. First of all, they minimize the entry of water. We can have good surface drainage. Sometimes we put impetus barrier at the top. Then whatever water enters the soil, it has to be removed quickly. So we use backfill of good permeability. Then we have to provide internal drains, deep holes like that. And wherever required, we have to design for hydro hydrostatic pressures. So sometimes what happens? So merely providing B pole will it give drainage? No. Actually, what happens? Because see, the water from the soil has to reach the B pole, then only it can come out. And in the case of fine grained soils, the permeability is very, very low, and water takes a very long time to travel and reach the B pole. So we have to provide a drainage also in addition to the B poles. Like if it is like if it is sand or gravel, then it's okay. Like water can immediately go to the report. But if it is fine grain soil, we have to drainage. And again, uh, suppose if you put a, provide a vertical drainage behind the cantilever wall, the effect is much less. Still, we can see the kind of excess pore pressure here. So best is like horizontal drainage or inclined like a chimney drain. So that will be the best performance. So even the drainage has to be carefully designed and neatly. And this is, of course, my last topic. One is excavation support. And again, we hear about a lot of uh, like accidents. Recently, a video had come, like a one trench collapsing and the worker being buried like that. So safety is very important. That is, uh, safety is first always. Like, see, normally, whenever like the, the trench is deeper than a man's height, so deeper than 1.5 meter, safety has to be a big priority. And uh, sometimes these uh, guidelines are available, like different types of soil, what are the safe slopes like that. So for uh, shallow excavations, we can follow that. So different types of soil categories also there, we can get this, uh, the OSHA has this guideline. And they also say like any excavation, which is uh, deeper than six meter has to be designed by a professional engineer. And sometimes we have, uh, like we have an existing building here. And then uh, adjacent, we have to construct a multi-story building. Assume it has a deep basement, like a two or three floor basement like that. So here we have to, like uh, stability of this is important. Like sometimes we have this shoring, like we may have a sheet pile or even a uh, board pile wall. But here, see, Apart from stability, the stiffness is also very, very important. Now, what happens? Like, suppose I have a cantilever sheet pile, like it, it will have some deflection actually. It will deflect. So, when it deflects laterally, the soil here, it will deform vertically. So that means this building will settle. So, sometimes you will find there is a house here, the walls are developing cracks like that. So, it, so the shoring system has to be designed for that also. Like, See, see, we are not allowed to damage this man's property, actually. So the design has to have adequate stiffness also, so proper bracing. And sometimes we have uh, this uh, post-tension grout bags, uh, grouted tie bags, actually. Suppose I have an anchor, we install uh, high-strength steel tendons, and we can pre-stress it so that the wall will not deflect. So stiffness is also very important. So. Uh, we have come to the, let us just recapitulate. So retaining structures are very common, like we need it in a lot of situations. It may be, we may be required to retain a fill or to cut, or sometimes to stabilize a natural steep slope like that. So depending on this, will uh, the type of retaining wall will depend a lot on whether it will retain fill or cut. Then we have looked at the major categories like mass gravity, RCC, embedded, then internally stabilized. We have uh, reinforced soil as well as soil nailing. 
we have mixed system, we have also hybrid systems like that. So reinforced steep slopes are also an option because I am emphasizing again, because normally people don't consider this at the planning stage actually, because many may not be aware. So, so we, we can consider this option also now. Then evaluate the various options, like just don't directly go for like RCC or Gabion or like that. See, we have so many options available, each with its own advantages, disadvantages. So we have to evaluate the site conditions, what is the, whether it is soft soil, big soil, like uh, what is the height, uh, what is the like design life, is it temporary, permanent, what kind of film is available, all those conditions we have to look and we have to arrive at the optimal solution. Then importance of controlling water and drainage is very, very important. Then sometimes we have to look at the safety of adjacent structures also. Then all stages are important, like investigation, design, construction, operation, maintenance, everywhere, like everything has to be due importance. Okay, with that, I conclude. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. And once again, I thank, bye. I thank um, uh, Mr. Nosky and Dr. Emil Joseph for giving me this opportunity. And uh, uh, any questions we can discuss now or later on also, if you have any doubts, please feel, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this uh, session. Uh, fascinating answer session. So if anybody has a doubt, Please uh, use this opportunity to clarify it. Jimmy sir, that was a very beautiful and interesting session going in, starting from the basic, going through what are the different types of retaining walls available, how it is used and what is the differences and going through Theotestales application, ME wall and the importance of going for touch piles, sheet piles. In fact, it, everything under the umbrella of earth retaining structures was covered and with the the adequate importance needed for drainage system was also highlighted. Thank you very much, sir. It's a very beautiful session. Uh, right, for, you you mixed experience along with the basic engineering so that it will be understandable to, for all the participants. Thank you very much for that beautiful session. And now yeah, to you, the Dr. participants for the question and answer session. As the uh, participants are asking question, I have a question. If we have a self-standing cut, what should be okay. the right way to do the retaining of that? So suppose in many cases, we have a self-standing cut during a summer, like it's a laterite portion. So what should be the minimum? And then during the monsoon time, like pointed out in your presentation, the moisture increases and the uh, slips happen. So what should we do? Should we, What should be the design concept for such a retaining wall? See, one option could be breast wall, like okay, or so soil nailing. Be? Breast wall or soil nailing. These two will be the okay. And see, what should be the wall, uh, like uh, because uh, breast wall may not be suitable in all strata, like uh, because see, breast wall means the strata has to be more or less self-supporting. So breast wall is only sort of a superficial protection like that. Yeah. So other option is go for soil nailing. Understood. Because, uh, because again, soil nailing maybe becomes slightly complicated actually, because see, normally we start from the top down actually. So here again, uh, we will have to have a platform or sometimes even people do from the crane actually. Yeah, because scaffolding system- like, Because we have to go to elevation and, ah, like that. Yeah, it will become a little more complicated. So best thing is to uh, like plan in advance actually, and then we'll have the correct solution. Because sometimes what happens, first we excavate and then later on only we start thinking like how to stabilize. Bindu, you can unmute. You are not unmuted. Yeah, please unmute yourself. Ah, okay, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, sir. It was a very informative and uh, <laughs> session. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, attend it from the start itself. So I missed uh, earlier, uh, I mean, slides. But anyway, so it was very good. The same thing what Anil asked was in my mind. 
So I would like to have a little bit elaborate uh, discussion on that because that's a very common uh, problem we all face. So like you said, breast wall is also not, may not be always possible. Suppose it is somebody else's property, we will not be able to do any oil nailing or do a, a slanting cut on that. So uh, is there any um, uh, basic equation where we can, uh, if it is a lat rate, we can take this much phi or C or something like that uh, to basically um, reduce the actual um, active soil pressure on the wall for uh, designing. See, um, um, see, actually, this is a very common problem. <clears throat> see, normally what happens, yes. people would like to use the maximum length. Normally, they will go yeah. to the boundary of the other and cut, actually. So then after that, virtually yes. no. And normally, soil nailing, length of soil nail, normally, again, uh, like 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.7 times height. That is normally that is required. And uh, less than 0. 0.5 times height is very, very rare. That's what I... No, as far as I know, okay. like that. Okay. So that much, uh, if uh, because normally, like we cannot encroach into others' property. That problem is always there. That is one limitation. Yes. Uh, and again, uh, see the breast wall. Again, it will work only if the strata is quite good, actually, like good, a weathered good. rock or kind of thing or hard light right. Maybe it will work because the design. See, normally what happens, uh, normal retaining wall, we assume cohesion is equal to zero. We take only five. But these yeah. type of soils have a lot of cohesion. And there are two yeah. practical problems. See, one, determining what is this cohesion is very, very difficult. Actually. Yeah. It's because see, we cannot, uh, see, normally what happens, uh, the five value, we do SPT and correlate actually like that. But these soils, they have both C and five. So from n value, we cannot get two parameters. Yeah. So normally, especially in the case of residual soil slat, right? People say we have to go with experience. Like, see, first of all, getting sample is very difficult. Then testing is very difficult. And if you look at the, because I have looked at many books like from Malaysia, they say in the case of residual soils, slat, right? We have to go with experience. Actually, people observe like yeah. the failures and they do the back analysis. And from that, we have to get a database actually like right that. Then uh, even uh, like retaining wall design, we may have to use some kind of a slope stability concept actually, right? Like, uh, because cohesion is there. Right? Okay. Yeah, that's what we um, all try to do. But uh, yeah, I, anyway, I understood, sir. Thank you, sir. And I mentioned that breast wall also, like normally people don't design, we, they use this tables actually because the strata is very complicated. It has a lot of cohesion, how to calculate their pressure, it becomes difficult actually. So uh, it's a lot of experience actually. So normally see, what we are not doing is uh, like basically over a period of time, we have to observe the various failures then yeah. try to get the soil data and build up a database actually. That is the only way yeah. we get confidence. Unfortunately, we don't do that. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, one, uh, uh, one more thing. Uh, like you said, uh, when the soil becomes fully saturated, it loses its cohesion. So what about laterite? Will See, it become uh, fully so saturated as to lose its uh, the cohesion? Uh, so that is the difference between residual soil. See. Yes. Yeah. Residual soils, how are they found? Uh, originally, the rock was very strong, actually. It has a very strong cohesive material. And rock weathers, it becomes weakens. Finally, it becomes soil, residual soil. But normally, in the yeah. case of residual soil, what they say, like the cohesion has not completely lost. In the case of other yeah. soils, sedimentary soils means the rock weathers, the soil is transported by wind or water. That means each grain becomes separate and it's deposited, actually. Yeah. Whereas in the case of residual soil, that soil is found there itself. So it will have still some cohesion, but it will be small, like maybe 5 kPa, 10 kPa, that range actually. But even small cohesion, uh, like has a big help. role. Yeah, like that. Yeah, yes, yes. So even if it is saturated, still it will have cohesion, like laterite anyway, because laterite has some cementing medium, like. Yeah. 
Yes. Cohesion has two, like one is true cohesion, which, came, which uh, comes from particle cementation, right? Other part is due to the negative pore pressure, that will be lost. But that, okay. uh, whatever due to cementation, that will remain. Okay, okay. thank you, sir.